about political regimes mobilizing people across the world to support. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted, and I got this honored position to speak at this point in the day, uh, being the last in the list, <laughs> and in a, an hour that in my place of origin is suitable just for a siesta. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to do, to do my best to keep you up, uh, but on the condition that you do the same. Okay, so when I read the title of this uh, series of lectures, I made my own interpretation of what should be discussing here, and I pay attention to the notion of mobilizing people on the one hand, and the concern on the undergraduate curriculum, and how can we internationalize or globalize our uh, Pedagogy. So my focus for this lecture is how can we bring the global dimension to the study of social movements in the courses that we teach. Okay, a total <laughs> set of topics, the global the social movements and its global dimension as we teach it. My short answer <laughs> is that there are big C's, the big C's for thinking history globally. And these four are comparisons, connections, contextualizations, and conceptualizations. You can finish the lecture right here because I <laughs> answer the leading question. Or we can move ahead and try to define these four. Now, given the abstract nature of those definitions, the exercise that we will be doing is to look upon social movements and try to apply in a concrete, instead of an abstract way, these four major strategies for thinking globally at large or thinking history globally in particular. So let's start by defining in broad terms what a social movement is. Uh, social movements are about processes a susta that sustain collective action, that challenge dominant arrangement, and that do that by methods that go beyond the use of party and electoral politics taking this broad framework about what social movements are, we can think quite immediately about what we are most familiar in the last years uh, of the 21st century, in which the Arab Spring, the uh, Occupy Wall Street, and a series of other social protests in uh, say, Madrid, Latin America, uh, came up to our TV screens uh, lately. So we have this idea of the social movements as grassroots movement protesting against the ways in which the political regimes or the economic systems are operating. kind of social movements I choose to uh, tackle today is different. Uh, it refers not to the last years of, of, of the beginning of the 21st century, but rather to what unfolded during what we call the short 20th century. This idea of the short 20th century running from the outbreak of the First World War, 1914, to the end of the Cold War, 1918. 89-1991. So during this period, I would like to argue, there were a lot of social movements happening rather simultaneously across the world. And as we will see, those social movements were different from the ones with which we are familiar right, right now, in that these social movements combined 
the forces of the grassroots uh, constituencies with the presence of a major political party able to take control of the mechanisms of the state and leading towards a major mobilization of society, which is a, the title of this lecture, this notion of mobilizing people. And in order to exemplify for you what these four big C's of thinking globally are, I'm going to focus, there is a light here mm -hmm. in the middle, mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to focus on my country of origin, Argentina, and tell you a known unknown story about Perón. You may not know about Perón, but you must know about Evita, right? <laughs> so Perón and Evita, eh, ruling Argentina between 1946 and 1955, they represent this type of social movement that I described for you, a combination of grassroots on the one hand and a leading party in charge of the uh, mechanisms of the state. Point of departure for Perón was a military junta. A military junta was ruling Argentina and it appointed one a, a lieutenant to the a Ministry of Labor. And this rather minor figure in the dictatorship, being the Ministry of Labor, started improving the conditions of the workers, coming to terms with the unions, and by doing that, accumulating a lot of support and a lot of power. The senior officials in the junta pay attention to the fact that this uh, side figure is becoming more and more prominent and decided to arrest him. He was arrested with very unclear prospects about his future. Here he is. And by the notice <coughs> that Perón was incarcerated, rather spontaneously, workers from throughout Buenos Aires started to move into the direction of the uh, uh, equivalent to the White House, the Casa Rosada, where the uh, uh, president of the dictatorship was, and in a matter of hours, hundreds of thousands of workers were there at the uh, square of Mayo, Plaza de Mayo, demanding the immediate release of Perón. Now, the junta was thoroughly surprised by this development. You know, I mentioned a moment ago the contrast between these short 20th century movements as opposed to those that we know for the beginning of the 21st, but this looks like quite the real square, right? You have this spontaneous movement claiming against this dictatorship and asking for the release of the leader. Now Perón became aware he wasn't far away from this place, he was aware of what is going on, by the end of the day, the Junta brought Perón in order to ask these people to go home. <laughs> and Perón said, I say that on one condition, that you will announce when election day will come. And soon after was election day, and Perón was elected president overwhelmingly. Now, since his appointment as president, he carried a quite transformative a series of policies in uh, Argentina, starting by the nationalization of all the infrastructures and the uh, natural resources. He promoted a program of industrialization, and you can see here the icon. So it, it, it's moving from 
rather a pre-Columbian stage to a fully a, a modernized economy. And also the wealth was divided in a more even way between the working class and the middle and upper class. So in a nutshell, these are some of the distinctive features of this regime. Nationalization of the economy, industrialization, a reshuffle of the wealth, and by doing that also promoting a domestic market. And in this regard, uh, transforming the place of the Argentinian economy uh, in the world context, looking more inwardly rather than being just an um, exporting uh, economy. Okay, so this is just for a background. I would be delighted to dedicate an entire lecture just to uh, <laughs> Roll, but, but we will miss the, the, the aim here. We want to see how, with this story, we can apply the four big C's. So let's start by comparisons. <coughs> Basically, comparisons are looking for similarities and differences between two or more units uh, of analysis. And when I'm saying units of analysis, that usually is two countries, two states, two societies. It can apply to other entities, but basically this is what we do most of the time. And we do that for analytical or a descriptive uh, purposes. Descriptive purposes is to say this is what happened in A, this is what happened in B, now we know something about A and B. Analytic purposes is more like a laboratory in which we try to isolate variables and say, oh, this variable is the responsible for causing the same development in the two cases, or the absence of this variable in case B is what explains the different outcome compared to A. So there is a wide range of possibilities with comparisons. Let's uh, illustrate the move by saying that about the same years that Perón uh, raised to power in Argentina, Vargas raised to power in Brazil. And very tellingly, Vargas started his career also in the framework of an authoritarian regime and later on, he gained popular support uh, based on his policies, which unsurprisingly were about nationalizing, industrializing, substituting the imports, and generating a domestic market. So all in all, we can see that in these two neighboring countries, we have an accumulation of power, but these figures in an authoritarian regime they uh, soon after develop a supportive social movement, uh, transformed into a mass party, and gain legitimacy through elections. They proceed with a transformative uh, economic set of policies, and they ended up by a military coup that was very reluctant of this transformation of the state, the social elites, the landed aristocracies, the uh, industrialist um, uh, uh, owners, uh, the foreign policy, uh, uh, the for, for foreign powers were very unhappy with those policies. And at the end, the intervention of the military brought these regimes to an end. By doing that, they open a cycle of military dictatorship, formal de democracy, going back and forth until very recently, indeed, until the 1980s, since this last democratic transition, these states remain under democratic rules. Now, we can take this comparative exercise beyond these uh, closed nations and look beyond the uh, continent into a wider horizon and look for the similarities as well as the differences between the regime that Peron established based on this mobilization of a broad segment of the Argentinian society to Nasser's regime uh, in Egypt. 
So here, once again, we see that Nasser accessed power by a military coup. He became the most acclaimed leader of the authoritarian regime that emerged in the uh, wake of this military coup that hosted the uh, Egyptian king. Uh, he won legitimacy by popular vote, and he conducted a series of economic reforms that are quite similar in the sense of nationalizing the infrastructures, the natural resources, um, redistributing the uh, wealth, um, uh, generating a, a domestic market, and so on and so forth. Also, in terms of foreign policy, both Peron and Nasser were part of this vision that they should not fall in either camp of the Cold War, but rather sustain a non-aligned policy. And both regimes were challenged by military interventions. In the case of Peron, as well as in that of Vargas, the military intervention was the local army that uh, took uh, power. In the case of Nasser, the army was with him, but he was challenged by foreign armies, the armies of France, England, and Israel, uh, that were uh, under the pressure of Soviet Union and Great Britain to withdraw from their invasion of the Suez Canal, and therefore Nasser ended up uh, reinvigorated by this military attempt in contrast to the fate of Peron and Vargas. So you see, we can do comparisons, we can stress the similarities, we can stress the differences, and we can do that by looking into this uh, broad reach of uh, possibility. Second comes connections. And the mental habit of connecting is completely different from that of comparison. While we compare, we hold these units in an isolated mood, right? We look at Argentina and what was happening in Argentina. We look at Brazil or Egypt as self-contained units, and we ponder about the similarities and differences. In connections, we are playing an entirely different game. We are not willing to keep these units self-contained, but to the contrary. All that matters for us is what transpires between these different units that we are interested to uh, analyze together. So connections focus on the ways in which two or more units of research are entwined in such significant ways that only by addressing those entanglements or connections, it is possible to make sense of the historical path of one or both units involved. So the claim of the connection is that, forget it. You will never, you will never have it right about Argentina under Peron, or Brazil under, under Vargas, or Egypt under Nasser, unless you connect those countries with their relevant others. So we can be tempted to say, OK, the way we compare Argentina and Brazil we can connect Argentina and Brazil. And we, in fact, can do this connection. But what is important in the, in the connection is to find the most relevant other, the other mate, the other unit, which make, makes the most sense to connect in order to explain the development. So for Argentina under Peron, probably the right mate is Britain. And in order to understand how Peron, how it was that Peron came to be in Argentina, we need to understand the decline of the British Empire in the sake of the uh, end of the First World War, and how Argentina, which was a, basically a client economy of uh, Britain, it was in decline as well. More precisely, the Argentinian landed aristocracy that provided Britain with beef was in decline. 
and this decline generated the power vacuum to provide an alternative economic model, one which instead of being an agro-exporting economy, aims to industrialize itself instead of exporting some uh, uh, staple, try to generate a domestic market. So uh, we can take this discussion into the... Where's the beef? Exactly, where's the beef? We can take this discussion to the main curse, to, 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 to the economy, or we can take the different layers of these connections, uh, such as soccer. No? Argentina was the first national team that came to play against England in a Wembley Stadium as it was inaugurated in 1951. Argentina led one nothing, but in the last two minutes the English scored two goals and Argentina, Argentina lost, but there was a revenge in Buenos Aires two years later and Argentina won 3-1. That day became El Dia del Futbolista, the day of the soccer player. And the Argentinians' uh, 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 periodicals published, we nationalized soccer the same way we nationalized the railways a few years ago. So you have all these different layers of social experience from the economy to the public uh, culture, uh, to the popular culture, uh, around this connection, this entanglement between these two societies. And you see that the take is completely different if you go from the path of comparing through the, or through the path of a connecting. Now, the third C is standing here for contextualization. So contextualization is a, a procedure that we normally do if we are aware of we are not. We always place our discussion in some context. The aim of this third C is to do that consciously and purposely, and we can do that at least in, in two flavors. We can take a region as our context, or take the globe as our context. Basically, contextualization is about adopting region or the entire interconnected world created by the process of globalization as the largest possible context in which we interpret and make sense of our particular case. How that will play for a, the regime of Peron? Okay, if we move beyond the original comparison that, that I suggested between Argentina and Brazil, and we look at the region, defined as the Latin American region at large, we'll find out that the kind of similarities I presented for you between Perón and Vargas are also to be found between all of these people here. So Lázaro Cárdenas and Betancourt and Arnulfo Arias and Velasco Ibarra, to name but a few, okay? So the moment we contextualize our own case in this broader regional setting, we realize that there is here something bigger going on, which we can summarize by saying, okay, in all of these cases, we see that there is a charismatic leader bounding with a broad social coalition, and this uh, interaction between these two set of players linked to social reform, economic regulation, and uh, an attempt of catching up to converge, converge with the industrialized economies of the North. Taking a point from the previous lecture, basically what you see here is a structuralist uh, economic policy, which is the uh, opposite end of a neoliberal policy. Now, if we want to go even bolder and bigger into the global contextualization, we should start asking how it was that the 
British economy declined and the landed aristocracy in Argentina declined and generated this power vacuum that allowed for the emergence of Perón in a global context. This would be a long story indeed, but to make it short, I will, I will take a few points. We can look at the economic crisis in 1929, in which the advanced capitalist economies were devastated, starting from the US. And then all the subsidiary economies throughout the world were devastated as well, all but one. The Soviet economy that was already isolated and was not playing in the international economy in these very same years was industrializing in a fast speed. And therefore, as unsurprisingly, leaders in the world, dismayed by the result of the capitalist economy, look at this alternative of a centralized economy. And this is how at the moment that the local political and economic elites were in decline as a result of the economic crisis, a new alternative leadership was emerging in so many countries, leading towards an alternative economic model, which was about commanding heights, which was about a central economy of industrialization and planification. And that is how this alternative model of nationalizing, industrializing, and conducting protectionist policies in foreign trade became so widespread. And when we look at the range of the spread of this uh, alternative uh, uh, model, we see that the result was that the globalized economy created laboriously since the 19th century, since the outbreak of the Industrial Revolution, this globalized economy was actually dismantled, was actually, it, it actually came to an end. So much so that when we awake in the 1990s to the sound of the word globalization, we were convinced that we landed in an entirely new situation <laughs> never experienced by my, mankind. But that wasn't the case. We were in a globalized economy since the 19th century to the very least. What happened was that this global way of Peron-like regimes happened throughout the short 20th century in such a way that a parenthesis, a deep valley of deglobalization happened since the outbreak of the First World War and up to the uh, end of the Cold War. Okay, So now we have this broader global contextualization which means that we, we could look not only at the regional scale of the context with all these Latin American regimes moving in that direction, but actually realizing that so many other regimes throughout rather simultaneous period were playing a similar economic and political game. So the way that Nasser in Egypt did that in the Middle East. We have Mossadegh in India, Nehru, eh, Mossadegh in Iran, and Nehru in India, and Sukarno in Indonesia, and Mao in China, and Truman in Ghana, and Turei in eh, eh, Guinea, and so on and so forth. So this brings me back to the map with which I open. Okay? We have this short 20th century with this plentiful of social movements combined with political regimes in this interaction uh, with each of them trying to catch up with the industrialized economies by protecting themselves with all these uh, high tariffs, by nationalizing their own resources, by generating their own domestic markets instead of trying to export 
to the developed economies. And in these circumstances, it's not surprising that globalization was in the retreat, so much so that by the time that we re-emerged into globalization in 1990s, we were thoroughly surprised uh, of the new phenomenon. So if you were to compare the degree of globalization between the 19th century, say at, at, on the eve of the outbreak of the First World War, about 9% of the uh, uh, GDP was traded internationally, and we reached again this dimension in the 1970s. If we look at the capital, invested internationally as a proportion of the uh, GDP, about 18% was already uh, uh, in existence in the uh, eve of the First World War. We reach again this peak by the mid-1980s. In between, we have the correlation between this type of regimes backed by social movements with the uh, deglobalization. So we did comparisons, we did connections, we did contextualizations regionally and globally. Time for conceptualizations, which is probably the most challenging one because this is the most abstract one. This is more geared towards social sciences, actually, the political science and sociology. So conceptualization is searching for recurrent structures and sequences of processes across time and space, and space in order to determine the necessary and sufficient conditions for a given phenomenon. So what are the kinds of conditions that will allow a regime such as that of Peron, or Nasser, or Vargas, or Sukarno to emerge? How can we make sense in a deeper way of these historical cases to generalize and um, articulate a model. Well, when we compare enough and connect enough and contextualize enough, we are in a good position to say that in all of these cases, we see that there is a combination of the apparatuses of a state, of a party, and of a social movement. These three components grant that there is a major accumulation of power. Okay? Again, you will see that these type of regimes, the bureaucracy of the state is combined by the bureaucracy of the party and the military uh, uh, the, the security forces of the state are oftentimes backed by security forces that come from a social movement. So you have all these duplicities that enhance the harnessing of society into the project generated by those regimes. And in fact, these regimes are mobilizing both the society and the economy guided by a collectivist ideology. Now, this overall mobilization is made for a radical transformation of the society from within and from a transformation of the place of that society in the global arena, in the world order. So, allow me to conclude by saying that Thematically speaking, we can see how different, how sharply different are the social movements that you are familiar with right now, these grassroots movements confronting political and economic regimes and systems with those of the short 20th century, which basically combine themselves with political regimes in order to develop economic system. And now that I made this thematic conclusion, I hope clear enough for you, I have the pedagogical challenge, challenge which is let's 
compare between these two ways of uh, social movements. Let's connect between them. Let's contextualize them and then conceptualize them. Okay? How are we going to make sense of all of these distinctions and connections between the current social movements and the social movements of the past? You can take this exercise right now, or at least you can take these four big C's for globalizing your curriculum and apply that for whatever you find best. Thank you very much. And now I am wide open to your suggestions for this exercise or for any other question, comment. Why didn't you include Castro? Oh, that's a, an excellent point. He's there. I mean, I, I, I said etc. Okay. So the list includes only some of the candidates, not all. Yes. So how do you use this in your classroom? Do you actually? Do you do this in your classroom? Well, I'm teaching, for instance, a survey of world history, and one of my major goals is actually to teach the students to compare, to connect, to contextualize, and to conceptualize. I teach them lots of content. Since the migration of Homo sapiens, <laughs> a hundred thousand years ago from Africa onwards, but for all of, with all due respect for all of the contents that I'm teaching them, what I'm trying to emphasize is these skills for analyzing a, a global setting. So whatever I'm doing, I'm comparing explicitly in front of them, and I'm connecting and conceptualizing and contextualizing, and this is also what I'm asking them to do in their exams and their papers. You have a paper on this? A paper on this particular... The C4C. Oh, there are uh, papers for the first two pairs and the second two pairs, because comparisons and connections are easier <laughs> both to understand and to apply. Contextualizing demands wider knowledge, and conceptualizing, you know, it's, it's quite an abstract exercise. But comparing and connecting are much more available. So I'm trying to take care to provide them with a good set of information. So even if they knew nothing before about the subject, and they will do no effort to know any additional <laughs> information besides what they are supplying, that will suffice for them to compare and connect. It's just the same everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Our students are all alike. There are some similarities. <laughs> Sorry? Could you contextualize those for me? Sorry? Could you contextualize those for me? Well, I, I, I think that perhaps the millennial generation is a good context to begin with. Yes, but this is our public, and this is the public we need to engage. And your students will say that the faculty are all alike, too. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you.